Well, I, like Irene said, um, I'm Jim Blandingham, and I do work at Boku, which is why she has to say all that nice stuff about me. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to be working there. Uh, I'm very fortunate that we are a data visualization team there, and we're making some really cool stuff. Um, and last year, like or two years ago, like she said, I presented at the first OpenVisConf. I was very fortunate for that, where um, I did some crazy stuff. Abusing the force is, is what I'm all about. And um, now we're going to dive into another uh, niche but very interesting topic, scrolling. So let's, let's get started. I'm not a UX expert or a historian, but I'll pretend to be both uh, for an introduction. Uh, scrolling's really been around since the beginning of GUIs, and it harkens back to uh, terminal-based applications, and it solves that very real problem of having too much data to display to your user and uh, having them be able to control the amount of stuff that they see. Uh, it's not the only solution to this problem you could think of. HyperCard and similar systems use a uh, stacking metaphor. And I found at least one operating system, a Commodore 64, that used that st stacking metaphor throughout the, the uh, file system. So there were no scrolling. Um, but scrolling st stuck around. It's been refined a little bit <laughs> over the years. <laughs> but I'd say it was a functional solution to this problem, but not a very elegant one until the introduction of a very uh, uh, important piece of hardware, and that is, of course, the scroll wheel. Uh, this is something that Microsoft uh, actually got right, and uh, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't invent it, but uh, they popularized this. It's been called one of the most useful innovations in pointy devices. I'm not really sure what that means, but I like it. <laughs> and, uh, of course, there were previous iterations that weren't popular, um, maybe due to aesthetic reasons. Um, but uh, the, the IntelliMouse in 96 added this scroll wheel. Apparently we have Excel to thank for this. The researchers in, uh, in Microsoft working on Excel were trying to come up with ways to zoom in and out of Excel documents. Um, turns out nobody really wants that. But it was the coupling of hardware and software that, allowed, that added the scroll wheel to scroll up and down in Microsoft and Excel documents. Now we live in a world where um, we have all sorts of pointing devices, as you might call them, scroll uh, trackpads and, and, uh, and magic mice. But all of them have uh, scrolling as a fundamental piece of, of uh, how they interact. And that makes scrolling very powerful. As uh, Joshua Porter uh, put it, um, scrolling is a continuation as opposed to clicking, which is a, a decision. So scrolling is something that you're already doing on the website. And instead of explicitly having to decide to click on something, uh, a user can just scroll. And of course, we've taken advantage of that on, in the web um, in many different ways. We have parallax scrolling for interesting um, ways to move foreground and background images for your new, new startup. We have infinite scrolling <laughs> for, <laughs> for your uh, for, to asynchronously load data. Um, in ways that might disrupt the ability to understand where you are in, in that data. And then we have art scrolling, which is a term that I just made up, but, <laughs> but it does exist. My favorite example of this is an embroidery website, which due to some malformed HTML, um, converts the help, helps into this kind of uh, <laughs> surreal tyrant on, uh, tirade on, on what it means to... <laughs> So it's a kind of a, a found web art in, in the realm of scroll. <laughs> I know you all want to make uh, your own scrolling art, so that's why I've made Embroiden, uh, a new bookmarklet that turns any Wikipedia article into <laughs> scrolling art. <laughs> You'll find that there. <laughs> Very useful. Uh, but today I'd, I'd like to narrow in on um, how scrolling is being used in data visualizations and interactive, um, uh, interactive pieces today. And I'd like to start with a little bit of a uh, categorization of the, of the different ways, the different examples of how I've found um, scrolling has been in, in use. And so we'll move from kind of uh, less complicated in terms of implementation details to more. And I'd like to start with uh, scrollable dimensions. Um, Really, this is uh, not, a, uh, not a tricky topic, but, but something that isn't used too much. But instead of uh, keeping your um, visualization confined to a single view, view frame, you can actually use scrolling to expand a dimension of your data. 
This is often done in um, distances. So here we have a website that allows you to scroll through the distance of a whole mile, and you can go to different reference points, like the world's tallest man, uh, if you want. And uh, it's collaborative, so you can add your own distances and, and measures. You can take this to space. Um, and here we're moving away from Earth and exploring uh, different levels of satellites as you move towards uh, the moon. Uh, you can take this to an extreme in space and uh, have the idea of the moon was only one pixel, what would the rest of the solar system look like? Uh, this is a great uh, project, something I would never want to scroll through twice. Uh, <laughs> but it is uh, impressive. There's a lot of space out there. Um, you have, moving up, in, in the terms of, of complication, you can use scrolling to trigger visualizations and, and, and interactions. Um, scrolling is interesting because as a user is scrolling on your website, there's a pretty good chance that they're engaging on that uh, website, or at least capable of being engaged. And you can take advantage of that. So Bloomberg has done that in the uh, trigger here. The scroll just starts the animation of uh, average heat indexes over, over time. To, to have a better sense of when the user is ready to engage in that. The New York Times does this a lot. Um, here, scrolling is used to load up images, uh, probably for performance, but also trigger uh, these cool animations about uh, World Cup soccer balls. Um, so it's getting the uh, interaction, the visualization, to the audience at the right time. Oftentimes, these um, visualizations are built around a narrative or a story. And scrolling can be used to direct that story and tell it in a, a real intuitive manner. A great example of this is in the uh, Color Meanings Project here, uh, which is a story around colors and how they're interpreted um, in English and Chinese uh, languages and cultures. So each, each scroll brings you to a new section, and each section provides a subset of the data and explanations around that. New York Times, again, has this with clubs that connect uh, a big mesh of, of uh, force layout of um, uh, soccer players and the clubs that they're in. Um, each section shows a different facet of the data set. And at the bottom, you can explore um, on your own and find your own team that you're interested in or your own player. Um, Bloomberg has a bunch of these. And we'll be looking at code in a second. Um, that is inspired by Bloomberg's work. Uh, but here's one about how uh, Americans love SUVs so much. And each section, again, slices and dices the data. And you can go to the bottom and find your own uh, vehicle. Mine's the Honda Fit. This, it turns out it's not, not nearly as popular as I was hoping. It's right there. A uh, slight twist on this idea is um, as this interesting visualization that uses scrolling as a transition between visualizations, so the sections transition. It can be a little distracting, but it's definitely a, an interesting way to get the user to keep scrolling down. They, they want to see what's coming next um, in, this, in this interaction around skateboards, skateboard competition. Um, because scrolling is a, is a continuous process, you can take advantage of that and, and move your visualizations in a continuous manner. Um, this is great for, for journeys. So here's a journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And the, the um, little map on the side there is updating uh, based on where you are. So it gives a great geographical sense of where these cities are, are located, as well as uh, some sense of how far you are in the article. Um, this kind of moving in infographic uses uh, continuous scrolling methods to show potential water waste and how much water we eat every day. And here the visualizations uh, are revealed in a, in a fluid manner, pun intended, and uh, similar to this one uh, around the inequalities in um, funding of elections. Again, the, the continuous scrolling is used to as an aesthetic purpose, but also shows real data. Uh, you can take this journey in 3D, and here um, the transition moves you into uh, the Don Wall uh, ascent, and we get to follow along with the climbers. And it really helps constrain the potentials of D3 and make it intuitive for 
uh, everyday reader. Oh, well, that's broken. Uh, interactive stro <laughs> 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 yeah. Bummer. Uh, interactive storytelling is, is kind of the, the last piece of, uh, of complexity. And here we see um, a lot of, of use of scrolling. Um, it's got a new name, scrolling telling. Uh, that might be German in origin. Uh, <laughs> but the ideas are kind of first popularized by Snowfall and still one of the most popular uh, scrolling telling uh, uh, examples. Uh, the idea is, is slightly more general than that, though. It's, it's, we have these different types of, of uh, content, like text and images and multimedia. And the web is where we can bring those together in, in a unique uh, medium. And scrolling can be a, an intuitive way to, to do that. Uh, you can use scrolling telling to tell stories about robots and techno music and, and fire. Uh, and this great uh, little Daft Punk expose. You can use it to tell more serious stories like uh, this one around um, uh, contention in, in the Philippines around these islands. And uh, it uses these great uh, video-based maps as well as images and text to set the story. OK, so now we've seen lots of examples of scrolling. I'm sure you all really want to learn how to implement one of your own. So we're going to. Uh, use a, a, an example of the, uh, to kind of motivate us. Let's see if it works. Well, we'll be a little offset. Here we go. So I, we mentioned that I was, in 2013, part of the OpenVizConf. And I, I mentioned that mostly to, to motivate this, this uh, example. I went back and did something that nobody should do. Uh, I, I listened to my talk again. And uh, I wanted to to analyze it in some way, but I, I kept focusing on my mistakes, my ums and, and uhs. And it turns out I had 180 of these, of these words. Out of uh, 5,000 uh, total words, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it really kind of smatters all over the place. <laughs> and it turns out I'm a um, um kind of guy. <laughs> Something I learned about myself. Uh, but I use uhs <laughs> sparingly. I was hoping that it, perhaps my, my ums and uhs were front loaded. And as, as uh, time went on, I built up confidence and you know, got into a groove. And it does seem to be kind of the trend here over the first 15 minutes. Uh, but then something happens, and it, and it ramps back up, <laughs> and I finish pretty strong. My theory is I heard a, a dry cough from the audience <laughs> right in the middle. That, that disrupted my, my flow, uh, wrecked my train of thought. And the uh, competing theory is that I just didn't practice the last half of my talk very much. Uh, the world may never know. Uh, hopefully, I'm doing better, but now you'll only be able to focus on all my mistakes, which is just fine. <laughs> so that's the demo. Uh, I'd like to tell the story around uh, diff two different pieces of that, of that uh, implementation, uh, stuff about the scrolling events and stuff about transitions and the visualizations. So let's talk about the events first. Um, the idea is pretty simple. We have a bunch of sections of content, and we need to figure out where they are first in our, in our visualization. So uh, we can use git bounding client rect as a native DOM uh, API JavaScript function to, to pull that out, uh, with the one caveat that uh, that function gives you a uh, value relative to the viewport, the current uh, section of the, the uh, site that you're looking at. So if you were to uh, scroll part way down and reload your page, um, the sections that you've already passed would be negative, and the upcoming sections would be positive. So we need to normalize against that a little bit. So here's, here's the main code. We're iterating through each section. Let me see. Yep, yeah, it's messed up. Well, you had to. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, you have to we iterate through each section and pull out their position. Uh, but we subtract off the section uh, location of the first section. Um, and that makes the first section start at zero at all always, and each other section is relative to that. So that helps normalize against this. Uh, now we need to figure out which viewport we're in. Um, 
I'm sorry, which section we're in, so that we can uh, trigger an event around that. And here's the code to do that. Again, we can use a native uh, function page y offset that gives you the current vertical scroll. And then we find the closest uh, index of the section in that, uh, to that position. Um, so bisect, D3 bisect does a binary search and pulls out the index of the closest section. Um, and then if that index is not the same index as the one we were at before, we can send an event to our visualization code. And D3, like many libraries, has a uh, uh, custom event uh, s dispatcher. Uh, a little bit around that, you create a new dispatcher using dispatch and you tell it which uh, types of events you want to send. Here we're, sending, we're telling it we want to send an active event and that becomes a method on your dispatch object that you can pass parameters to. And then the, um, in your visualization code that we'll look at in just a second, um, you listen to that event using the on method and do something with the, that index. And so that's all for the scrolling side. Now uh, transitions. If you're not familiar with D3, transitions are, are ways to animate visual elements. And um, we can get started by setting up all the, our visual elements at the start. Um, here's an example using uh, setting up the, uh, one of the titles. And we can set everything's opacity to zero to um, hide everything at the beginning. Then each section of our, our uh, visualization will have a function. And we can index uh, into an array to store those functions. And then on the uh, event, the active event, we can just call the appropriate function. So we're using that index as a, a key uh, between the scrolling code and the visualization code. Um, these, these functions have two responsibilities, showing themselves and hiding the neighboring uh, transitions. And you could do, implement this in a number of different ways. You could have an enter and exit function for each slide, but this is, uh, works well for these uh, simple examples. Uh, so for, for this section, where I had a bunch of gray squares, um, I need to hide the title before and make sure that the, the section after uh, that turns out some of the squares green is undone by setting all their fills to gray. And then I can just make sure my, my squares are, are visible using opacity of one. Um, and an important uh, reminder is that every, every modification of these visual elements should be a transition. Uh, to demonstrate that, I have a couple of examples. Here's uh, regular transitions between two points. Um, and this is uh, doing a left to right and a right to left transition and working as expected. Here's uh, an example of interrupted transitions. So here the left to right gets interrupted uh, and then goes back to, to the right to left. And as long as everything's a transition, that works as expected. Uh, which is the, the visualization goes to the spot you want. So this would be an example of the user scrolling uh, in the middle of one of your transitions. Um, here's what happens if you try to set the attributes directly without a transition. The, the position changes, but the transition is not uh, interrupted, and so the visualization gets into an invalid state. Fortunately, at D3, it's easy to set uh, transitions or make everything transitions. You just use the transition method on your selection. And if you want something to happen immediately, you set the duration to zero. So uh, once you guys get internet again, uh, you can check out this and, and a lot more in my new tutorial that I just put out because I have special internet back here. <laughs> <laughs> so we've heard all uh, great things about um, scrolling. Let's talk a little bit about how terrible it can be. Um, to remix that, that quote, scrolling is a continuation unless it's disrupted in some way. Uh, and the, and the, the connection between a user and the website through scrolling can be quite fragile. Mike Bostock has a great article about how to scroll, um, which serves as a number of best practices when you're building out these things of what um, to, to keep in mind. But a lot of it comes down to not scroll jacking. And scroll jacking is, it can be defined as any time where you're uh, ripping control away from the user and doing uh, something that's not expected around the scrolling. Um, this can be um, subtle, or like in this example, um, the 
the scrolling uh, a small amount of scrolling causes a large change in the view uh, and delays that you have to wait for, or it can be much ex more explicit in a, a popular uh, clothing website that I may or may not have worked for in the past. <laughs> um, the uh, image hover over you know causes a zoom, which is great, but it also hijacks the scroll completely so that you uh, forms this scroll jacking zone that you can't escape from uh, unless you know what you're doing. Um, another more subtle way where uh, uh, this uh, continuousness can be broken is, is perhaps in the two competing mental models that we have to, to talk about scrolling. And Jesper Clydell has a, a great essay about this um, where he describes the two different models. Uh, we have the moving window model and that's, this is what we've actually been using um, with our scroll wheels where the document is fixed and we are in control of the window a viewport moving up and down on that document. And then but the advent of touch screens and, and uh, the flipping of the trackpad, which probably everybody flipped back, uh, is the moving document model or moving text model where the, doc, the, the window is fixed and we're in control of that um, text. We're in control of the actual document that moves up and down when we scroll. So that's why the, that's why the orientation's flipped when you scroll and when you um, scroll on a, a touch screen, but also kind of help explain um, the fragileness of this, this concept. So what are some alternatives? Uh, well, as an anonymous important data visualizer said, <laughs> I miss the days of the stepper. And the, the stepper, of course, is not dead. If you're not familiar with the stepper, here's an example um, where we're using click. Uh, we're defaulting back to click to explicitly walk through uh, sections of the data similar to some of the scrolling examples I was given. Bloomberg has uh, done some really great steppers as well. And uh, the steppers returned to the New York Times with the advent of the 3D uh, chart that only works really well because you can explicitly step through pieces of it. Um, but part of that inconsistent model piece was, is around the differences between mobile and, and desktop experiences. So I wanted to see if um, these special kinds of scrolling were used in, in mobile environments. It turns out not so much. Um, of all the examples that I just gave, most of the more complex ones uh, revert to a simplified scrolling uh, system. Um, and yet there are, uh, so, so is, is it wrong to scroll on, on mobile or are there competing other reasons why um, these, these uh, visualizations are defaulting to more simpler mechanisms? I think it's a little bit of both as a hopeful segue to the WebGL part of, uh, of this conference. Um, the, the Dawn Wall was one of the few ones that was kept a consistent uh, implementation and experience on mobile as well as desktop, and that's using WebGL. So we might talk about more of that, hopefully. Um, and yet there are uh, mobile-first and mobile-capable visualizations. Uh, this one uh, about uh, motorcycle deaths, and this one about U the Ukraine and Russia, both by Hannah, Fel Hannah Fairfield, which we'll, who we'll be talking tomorrow, um, use the concept of or the interaction of swipe. So is, is swipe the new scroll. Um, I wanted to look at mobile visualizations around um, around that that idea, and uh, luckily for me, Irene has compiled a great a repository of, of visualizations that work well on mobile, uh, mobile viz. Everyone should go check it out and it's uh, community driven so we can collaborate and add our own examples. So um, how many of these are using swipe? Turns out not many. Um, which isn't to say swipe is wrong. Only about seven of them use, use swipe. Uh, but um, it turn, I think that is an uh, indication that there's a lot of room here to uh, work and, and as tools become better and as uh, the formats in the, in the platforms become more consistent, we'll start to see more of this types of interaction. Um, so speaking of tools, I'd like to end real quick with uh, some libraries that you could try out. Adam Pierce from Bloomberg is, is working on this graph scroll, which is a really great library and it's making most of my tutorial I just put out. Uh, defunct and, and you shouldn't pay attention to it at all. And, and then so Scroller and Swiper are both geared around uh, mobile interactions. 
to make those more consistent. There's also uh, GUI tools or, or uh, these more visual tools. Uh, Pleans and Odyssey JS both allow uh, visualizations that in incorporate scroll around positions and locations. And then there are tools like PageFlow that uh, try to uh, bring in images and media to make a more uh, scrolly telling kind of experience. So uh, I'd like to end with a uh, special thanks to Adam Pierce again for help with the code, Irene Ross for this wonderful conference and uh, her mobile Viz stuff and Lynn Cherney for all of her suggestions and, and wonder. Uh, thanks very much. Let me know what you think. Uh,